what Microsoft plans or licenses do I need to meet CMMC level two? How could the placemat help us there? Hey everybody, it's Jacob. I'm here with Mr. Justin Orcutt from Microsoft. How are you doing, Justin? I'm doing great, thanks for having me. Good, good, thanks for coming on. Tell us about what you do at Microsoft. My name is Justin, I'm Director of Cybersecurity at Microsoft, specifically for the defense industrial base. So I have the privilege of working with some of the largest defense contractors around the world. Our team also helps support any sort of escalation that might exist as related to GCC High and Azure Gov. I've been at Microsoft for the past three years, working exclusively on this team and helping defense contractors with cybersecurity. Today, we're talking about the CMMC product placemat uh, from Microsoft. A new version just came out, and so I wanted to do this with you so that you could kind of walk us through it and help people understand how to use it and what it's meant for and how it can help them. Absolutely. Well, the product placemat is a really helpful resource for any customer that's currently thinking about how they could leverage Microsoft to achieve CMMC practice objectives or practices. The CRMC placemat started several years ago. It was one of the things that attracted me to Microsoft. So this has been in the works since before I joined. Then again, it's a tool that any defense contractor can use. It's free. It's publicly available. You could download it and you'll get a copy of this Excel sheet that I'm looking at right now. The first page is instructions, and I highly recommend anyone that is trying to leverage the placemat read this set of instructions. The one thing that I'll call out is that when we built the placemat, we built it for CMMC levels one and two, and we made some assumptions about level three, which is not completely out in its final form. Even though we recently released a new version of the placemat, we did so before the CMMC final rule. So there's still some changes that will need to be incorporated, and we'll publish that as soon as we can. As you could imagine, there's a lots of iterations to uh, this placemat before it becomes publicly available. The other piece that I'll call out is we don't differentiate in the placemat of which cloud environment we're talking about. So it's important that you as an organization seeking certification, consider the type of data you have and which cloud environment is best for your business purposes. We do have a link inside this placemat that'll bring you back to a blog that we have about our different environments from commercial to GCC to GCC high and other environments that we have as well. So scroll down in the instructions and, and please do read that blog as well. Let's go ahead and jump into how to use the placemat. Most people that use a placemat will only use this tab on the Excel sheet. And as you can see, the product placemat has all of the different domains inside CMMC on the right side of the screen. And on the left side of the screen, you have all the service panes. These are all the services that Microsoft provides that could help you with your CMMC objectives. Most of these services are either available for consumption, so inside Azure, or they are part of your license with M365 or any other licensing that you might have. Speaking of license, you could come up to the top and you could select which license you ha currently have. So you might be using a E3, which is interchangeable with a G3, or you might have an E5, which is exchangeable with a G5, or you might only have certain add-on components, or maybe you're using a frontline worker SKU. So the first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to select which license set you're currently using. You'll see when I selected the license, on the right-hand side, the colors of the individual practices change. Let me just do that one more time real quick, just to illustrate it. You'll see that these two are gray now, whereas when I move over to the M365 E5, they turn a different color. Those colors indicate something. So a blue means that a primary service is available to help in achieving that particular requirement. And an orange would mean there's a secondary service available to helping achieve that requirement. What do I mean? If you know you have a control gap with, let's say, this audit and accountability control 3.3.1, because you went through and you performed a gap assessment, seeing that light up blue means that there is a service available that you could implement that is a primary contributor to you achieving that requirement, because there's a technical control that we have that can uh, help you in achieving that objective. Let me give you an example, and I won't do it in terms of CMMC practice objectives, but you might have a requirement to deploy multi-factor authentication as part of CMMC. 
Well, we have a primary service, which means, you know, if implemented, it goes the majority of the distance to you achieving your requirement. And we have a MFA tool called Microsoft Authenticator that is available to help you in achieving that specific MFA requirement. So again, primary service is something where we have a service that acts as the leading technology component that'll help you in achieving your specific requirement with that practice area. When you click on the different individual practices, you'll see on this right-hand side in the service pane, the different services light up different colors, right? So again, just for visual purposes, I'm gonna click this SC3.13.6 and you'll see on the left-hand side, the colors changed from when we were at 3.1.11. So you'll double click on the control that you're looking for. On the left-hand side, where you see blue, that means it is a primary service to helping you achieve that objective. Orange would be, it's a secondary service. The secondary service is a technology that we have that acts as an enabler to you achieving your CMMC practice objective. It's not the main thing that you'll use to satisfy that objective, maybe because the main thing you'll do is a training, for instance. So you have to actually host the training and deliver the training. But we might have a product in our portfolio that allows you to maybe host the training or deliver the training. The practice of actually doing it is the primary enabler. For some controls, we don't have a primary service. It would be secondary or it would be supportive of the main thing that you're doing to achieve that practice requirement. Available enablers are areas where Microsoft does not have any main service that would go towards achieving that practice area. So it might be something that you need to deliver through specific configurations. Available enabler means that none of the enabled Microsoft services can deliver that practice area objective. No available enablers means there's no services inside of the Microsoft umbrella that we've identified as part and placement of that can help you in achieving that practice objective. So a really good example of that would be a policy that you might need to have in place where we cannot do anything to help you with that policy or that procedure. It's something that you would need to do. Maybe a good example of that would be a sign-in log and physical location. That would be something that you need to manage completely and entirely on your own. Now, you might say, okay, great, but how does that specific practice help me in achieving the control? So what you'll want to do is you'll want to scroll down in the product place map and you'll want to see what the practice details are. So for this one on 3.3.1, the requirement is to create and retain system audit logs and records to the extent needed to enable the monitoring analysis, investigation, reporting, and unlawful or unauthorized system activity use, right? So you need to do logging and you need to do monitoring. Is this a Microsoft responsibility or a customer responsibility? It is a share responsibility. We give you the tools and the capabilities to do it for the services that you're using, but we also maintain logs of our own for uh, the services that you're consuming. These map to different MIST 853 controls. Why is this important? You might have other technologies that you use that are also required to be FedRAM moderate or equivalent. So you might have a controls matrix of various different control mappings to this 853. It also tells you where the control is derived from. So you could look at that derivative control and get additional information on what's needed, how to implement it, and how it maps to your requirements. And then there's the implementation guidance. Okay, can you talk to us about specific examples where there is a primary service, secondary, and available enablers, and then kind of align that with what that means? For this particular control that I'm on right now, which is enforce a minimum password complexity and change of characters when new passwords are created. For this specific practice, we have primary enablers, which would be Entra ID. Entra ID is where you would set up and configure password policies in order to meet the minimum password complexity requirements of CMC. With this particular control, a primary service would be Entra ID. There might be secondary services available that would also help you in achieving this particular password requirement. 
For instance, on the left-hand side, you see Intune Suite being lit up as a secondary service. The reason why it's a secondary service is you can set up requirements to use a password in certain places where you want a user to authenticate to, or you can set up a device policy to require the device to be locked and require a password to be unlocked in order for them to use the device. And on that device, there might be CUI. So the use of Intune alone will not help you in satisfying this requirement. Mm -hmm. The use of Intra with the correct policies and procedures put in place will help you in achieving this practice objective. And you would not mean to use uh, outside third-party service. We also have the available enablers, which means that there are services that could be configured to achieve the requirements, but you're likely to have to do other things outside of the Microsoft umbrella. A great example of that is with MA3.7.6. This particular control requires you to supervise the maintenance activities of personnel without required access authorization. Well, you could think of this in a traditional sense where if you had a colo that you were running and someone had access to a server, you need to make sure that that uh, access is monitored and supervised and that activities were properly tracked. So we have the capability to supervise those maintenance personnel using Microsoft Intra ID using privilege identity management. So that's the idea of providing just-in-time access to go ahead and, and perform that function. However, there's oftentimes that the CUI is outside of Microsoft's umbrella, which means there are other activities that you're going to have to perform and configure and maintain in order to achieve this particular uh, practice area requirement. Mm -hmm. So we say that there's available enablers because there are things that you could use in the Microsoft stack. However, there's things that you're going to have to do outside the Microsoft stack in order to supervise and maintain activities, personnel access when they're required. So again, a available enabler means we have things that will help, but there's things that you're going to have to do above and beyond what Microsoft has available to you. We have documented here customer responsibility of managing maintenance personnel and designated organizational personnel with required access authorizations and technical competence to supervise the maintenance activities of personnel who do not possess the required access authorization. And so, you know, you'll have to perform additional things in order to achieve that practice requirement. And I would highly urge any customer to look at what the assessment objectives are under NIST 800-171A in order to fully satisfy those requirements. So I would like to tell customers that as you're developing your own system security plan, we all know those take a lot of time, a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. If you're unsure how you're going to implement this control, this is similar to an implementation summary that you might write up for your own SSP. So read this, see what it said, and see if you're doing those things already. If you are, then you might be able to use some of this language. If you're not, this might be a desired future state. If you see aspects of this that you like, but there's other aspects you don't like, you can implement the pieces that are beneficial and helpful to your program and forget about the rest. But this is designed to give you a starting point of how you could implement this control using the services that were illuminated on the left hand side. I know that there is also a PDF, a Microsoft Technical Reference Guide for CMMC. So does that have more information or is it the same or what does that look like? Great question. These two documents were designed to work with one another. So we always point people towards the product placemat first. Because most people say, well, what could I do with the license that I own, right? So to answer that question, it's very easy. You come up here and you switch it. And you can also, by the way, select which level you're pursuing. And it'll change the controls. And once you identify, okay, I know I have a gap with this identification and authorization control, you can read the implementation summary. And you might say, you know what? I'm still a little bit confused about enforcing password complexity requirements. I need to dive a little bit deeper. That's where the technical reference guide comes in. It goes that next layer to help you understand how to use the different services to meet those CMMC requirements. And it also provides additional backlinks to Microsoft Learn Pages. So maybe you're unfamiliar with how to use Microsoft Intra. 
and you want to learn how to use that capability, it'll have backlinks that'll bring you to very specific pages where you can read, where you can participate in learning opportunities to help you maximize your investment in that particular tool. So a very common question that I'm sure you're used to hearing is what Microsoft plans or licenses do I need to meet CMMC level two? How could the placemat help us there? I get that question frequently from customers. Someone is pursuing level two and they want to know what should I be using in order to meet CMMC level two requirements. So the first place I point them to is the product placemat, right? You select level two and then you can go through and you can pick licensing. I would say, let's start with where you're currently licensed. So you might currently be licensed with the E3 license. And I say everything in blue is something we can help you in achieving. And I recommend that companies take a look at identification or ID and access controls as a first step. Why? Identity is your foundation. Everything comes from being able to protect the user and their identity and uniquely identify that user with the activity that's being performed on the network. You need to make sure that you're at least privileged to CUIs. For that reason, you want to start there. So if you're someone that's trying to figure out for the first time, I need to be CMMC level two compliant. What does Microsoft offer me? I would point them here. Again, select the level you're pursuing, select the license that you want, and see where blue magically appears. You can also scroll down and you can see that using that E3 license, Microsoft has coverage over 70% of the controls using a primary service, 22% using a secondary service. So combined, it's a pretty high amount of coverage to help you in achieving your requirements. How about from a level one perspective? Maybe we could just walk through that as well. I like reminding companies that at level one, you likely have FCI, federal contract information, and at least from an access control perspective, identity and authorization, physical controls, system communication and protection, system information integrity, we give you really good coverage, but there's still some things that we cannot fully do that you're going to need to handle on your own. And these are these dark grayed out areas here. But again, you're getting strong coverage with 70% coverage on, on primary controls and then 18% coverage where we could give you secondary services available. There's still 12% of the controls that you need to do on your own and be able to manage and document. All right, Justin, thank you so much for coming on and showing us the place, Matt. I know this will help people who actually want to use it. Any last words for us? Hopefully you guys find this product place, Matt, very helpful and very beneficial to your journey to achieving CMMC certification. This placemat would not be possible without our partners at Qzara who helped develop this placemat and all of the subject matter experts that put in time and effort in reviewing this and providing feedback. There is a link on the instructions page which give you an opportunity to provide any feedback. So if you see something that's missing here, if you think of an idea that might make this more impactful or beneficial for the community, please use that link, provide feedback, or reach out to myself or anyone else that you know that is uh, part of our team and provide that feedback. That way we could continue to improve and evolve the placemat and the technical reference guide. Thanks for having me, Jacob. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Awesome. Thanks again. Anytime. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed that. If you want to see more, be sure to subscribe and then check out this video.